So stay with me for one more session before lunch and the awesome French fries, as Celia already announced. Um, I have to be honest with you, I did not prepare any kind of introduction slide, but then everybody did some kind of an awesome introduction, so I'm kind of bowing to the group pressure and will tell you a few things about myself. So I've been working on UX and the game industry uh, for more than 10 years now. And before I joined game industry, I was working in research of human-computer interaction and robotics. And currently I'm the UX supervisor at Ubisoft Düsseldorf and I worked on projects like For Honor, the Anno brand, Settlers brand. And currently I'm on Uplay, which honestly takes challenges of UX to a completely different level. But we're not going to talk about this. All right. So before we jump directly into the topics, I would like to tell you that this talk is going to be a little bit different. So I'm not going to talk about one specific project I work on. It's more meant to be something like an inspiration talk for you to give you some ideas on how to approach uh, complex interfaces and complex information because this is something we at some point just come to deal with. Also, I will give you a very quick overview of uh, the talk, so we'll, you will know... Oh, it's not there anymore. Okay, so you will know what kind of topics are going to be covered. You have more context and more understanding of the overall things. So we will start with some theory about cognitive art, because I believe this is a term that not many of you might be over-familiar with. Then we will have a look at some methodologies on how to create cognitive art. We will do a quick... Um, around about interactivity, because interactivity is a game changer in this kind of topic. And lastly, we will talk about games and some use cases, because games is why we are here, right? Okay, so let's jump in and demystify the term of cognitive art. Actually, before we do this, I will start off with a short quote, which says, seeing is thinking. Now, it sounds a little bit like a trivial horoscope quote, I give you that. However, stay with me for a couple of more minutes and then everything will make sense. Okay, cognitive art. So maybe some of you already know, but uh, cognitive art is a type of visualizing information like maps, graphs, charts, blueprints, so whatever is there to inform the users or human beings. And depending on who is actually dealing with the subject, they can be called informational images, data visualization, you name it. And now the thing about cognitive art or information visualization is that we can consider them as frameworks for better thinking. Now there is one small issue I have with them, because usually we learn that specific types of information visualizations are strictly linked to some disciplines. Like we learn in school that graphs are used for math, diagrams for biology, maps for geography, and so on. But nobody teaches us this kind of a visual skill that helps us determine what kind of visualization might be the right one to present and communicate my information. Because maybe maps are not always the best, uh, the best idea to present some geographical facts. So um, we should try to conceptualize those tools and uh, help our users to make up their mind and uh, give them the right way to think about whatever subject we want to communicate. Oh, it's still not really full screen. I did not notice. I'm sorry. OK. <laughs> no other distractions anymore. So actually, we need to distinguish visualizations from something like visual images. Because visual images are aesthetic forms of art. It's about beautification. But visualizations are here to, to inquire, to help people understand information and decide in a better way. And there are different types of visualization. So on the one hand, we have the representational visualizations. So like something like this. Um, you can clearly see this is some kind of an architectural model, a blueprint, a prototype. Everybody of you will immediately understand what this is about. You do not need any prior knowledge to be able to identify what this information is about. 
On the other hand, you have abstract visualizations. So uh, you have there different types of brain imaginary or ECG graphs. So this is not obvious enough. And you need some kind of prior training to be able to interpret and understand this kind of information. However, I think we can all agree that being able to read this kind of information might be literally life-saving. So again, for you as designers, you always need to know what is the audience, what, is, uh, what are the people I'm trying to communicate with. So uh, context is here your best friend. You need to know what kind of visualization is the right one. Is it the representational one? Is it the abstract one? What's the knowledge? What are the skills of your audience? And I will give you a couple of examples. So let's have a look at this one. What do you think is this? Any guesses? I assure you that you most likely know exactly what it is. Okay, you're giving up. Okay. So you're familiar with the Mandelbrot set, right? Okay, I hope you just starved to death. <laughs> but anyway, um, visualizing this piece of information helps you immediately to understand the most important things, like the recurring fractal shapes that this functionality is describing. But you do not need to understand any kind of uh, mathematical formula in order to understand what is it about if you just change the way how you visualize this piece of information. I have another one for you, a more easy one. Any guesses? Come on. Yeah, yeah, location, geodata, exactly. But where? Yeah, there are some educated guesses, true. But you would not know for sure. And actually, the cool thing here is with a different type of visualization, you do not only know where the location exactly is, but you get to know lots of other information as well. Like, what does the area look like? What does the building look like? Is there any kind of good transportation and so on? So you will have a lot uh, of different additional information that will help you to make your decision uh, more informed and more secure. So actually, coming back to the seeing is thinking, the main message here is if you change the way how you show information, people will start dif to think differently about the subject or they will even start to think about it at all. Like uh, Dory's example yesterday, I think many of us were not even willing to try the mathematical calculation because it, it's not a form of information that we like to deal with. However, if you change this way, people are really starting to give it a try to really think about it and occasionally even find out they do understand stuff that they might not even be willing to dive into before. So this is a very powerful tool to know about, that information is not just one way to be visualized, but there are different ways. Okay, by the way, do you know what this is? Okay, so this is also a type of visualization, it's called uh, the circular migration chart, and it's usually used for depicting genomic information chromosomes. So most likely nothing that we will be working on in the near future, who knows, maybe some kind of games will be there, nevertheless. So there are different types of visualization, not just charts, maps, and so on. Okay, so much for the theory. Now let's have a look on how we can create cognitive art. Now there are different types of methodology, but today I would like to present you one that um, I find really intriguing, especially for us, uh, and for any kind of visual designers here, and it's called envisioning information. So maybe some of you are familiar with this. Um, it's a framework introduced by Tafti, uh, professor of information design and data visualization. And he defined one problem in the 90s, which was called escaping flatland. This is not a pun to the flat earthers, by the way. Um, so he said that we are living in a three-dimensional world. So whatever we encounter is three-dimensional. However, if we put those information on any kind of display, this information gets immediately, uh, well, scaled down to a two-dimensional medium. 
usually some kind of paper, wallpaper, books, whatever, back then. So this is what he was talking about. Like if you have the reality on one side and try to do an as accurate representation of this reality, it gets really strange. So, well, maybe some of you spend too much time of skinning 3D objects. Then you should get a hobby first. And second, you're the majority. Because most people will be not able to say that this is actually the same object. So basically, the more abstract the 2D representation of the information is, the more difficult it is for us to actually make this uh, cognitive link, the connection to the facts that are underlying. So Tafti created a framework of five principles that are meant to add one additional layer of information, one another dimension to this flat surface of information visualization that should help us improve this kind of process. So I will quickly walk you through the five principles um, before we move over. So the first one is called micro and macro readings. And like this famous quote says, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Because simplicity does not equal quality in many cases. So one good example for this um, would be the strand of flat or minimalistic design versus the skeuomorphic design. I think while we do agree that a minimalistic design is very beautiful, at some point it is still interesting and also important in terms of affordances and interaction to have this kind of additional detail. Like you see this small shadow that un unlines the, the button, so it immediately prompts us uh, to click on it. So adding some detail sometimes can really help to explain what this functionality or this information is about. Okay, next one, the layering and separation. So Tafti defined one problem that says one plus one equals three. And what it means is, like here, for example, you can see that this is uh, like a deconstruction of a mechanical device. And on the right side, you have those red marks, which uh, are an information layer on top. So at some point, there most likely will be a legend explaining every part of this device. But if you do not do this kind of distinction between colors, you will get one flat image with lots of art artifacts that do not give us any kind of clue, not about the device, not about the information. So we are not able to um, identify it anymore. Another one of my favorite examples is actually this one. So it is a pie chart, but it's also not a pie chart, right? This, this is the clear thing of a very unlucky choice of colors. So once you saw it, you cannot unsee it anymore. It will always stay the sunny and the shady side of the pyramid and the sky, even if you actually read the right types of information. So this piece of information will always stay at the back of your mind and will kind of obstruct understanding what the information was initially about. So we need to make sure that the information layers get really distinguished properly. And usually color is a... <laughs> You're done? <laughs> color is a very good indication. Which brings us to color. So color is very sensitive. Um, but we need to take in consideration what kind of natural uh, expectations people have with colors. So let's have a look at the quick example, which is a good one. You have a map that clearly shows which parts are the land and which parts are the sea. And even by distinguishing colors or shades of the blue, you can see how deep the water here is. So it's very natural. We do understand it. There needs, there's no need for other explanations. What about this one? So let's start with the easy parts. Blue, water, most likely. Green one might be the land, the dark spots, forests or mountains, we're not really sure. OK, now it gets trickier. What about the yellow? Is it like the shore? But if it's the shore, why, this, why is it in the middle of the forest? Or is it a desert? Well, and the red one, what is it? Like lava. Well, so you can see that tying color to information is crucial, but you also need to make it to take into consideration that there is a natural expectation on how colors behave. 
The next principle is called the small multiples, and it's basically creating some kind of context and comparison. So here are two examples. Um, the left one is uh, different train signals, and the right ones are uh, various brain conditions. Um, and here you can see that, or this, this is a good visualization that basically helps you to create your choice based on various alternatives that are given. So if you know what kind of conditions there are, it is much easier for you to um, pick the right one and, and this helps us to make much better and much more informed choices we are much secure about because we kind of know the whole context. So this helps us compare and make better decisions. And finally, the last principle is called narratives of space and time. And actually, the official description of this one is that it's a comprehensive narrative description, which requires both the time and the spatial experiences. Now, this sounds very fancy, right? And I'm really disappointed to tell you that the perfect example for this is train schedule. Yeah, but still you have like the, the spatial experiences, which are the stops, and the time experiences, which are the basically the departure times. But another example for this would be, for example, um, different displays of a watch. So both show you the same kind of information. However, some visualizations give you additional information that the others do not. Like an analog watch will not tell you anything about AM or PM. However, having a look at the clock hands, their size, their speed will give you an idea about the duration of a second or a minute and so over. So, there, it's not like one is better than the other. It's again, it depends on the context. Context is your best friend here. You always need to take into consideration what is required and what is expected. So, summing up the methodology part, we can say that if we pick the right visualization, the truthful design, it shorts the time of decoding information, basically understanding what this information is about. So the visual uh, task here is to create contrast, comparison and choice. And this will ultimately help human beings or our users to make fast and correct decisions, which is a very empowering feature. Okay, now we cover theory and methodology and we will move over for a quick excursion to have a look at interactivity because it's a real game changer here. So I already mentioned that the envisioning information framework was designed in the 90s. And back then, the mainstream medium for um, this kind of information displays was, was a static canvas, something non-interactive like books, billboards, uh, posters, and so on. But today, we are having a completely different types of medium we use for informing ourselves. It's our mobile phones, our tablets, our computers, and they are highly interactive. So this brings us to a point where we have a much bigger possibility on using those kind of principles. Like before, you could use one or maybe two because otherwise the image would be just too cluttered. But now we have the possibility to, to use even all of them at the same time, thanks to interactivity. And I will give you a quick example with Google Maps. So let's have a look. So before, if you had to uh, access micro and macro readings, you had a globe or an atlas, so you could flip the pages and looking for the right representation. Right now, you can not only switch between different types of visualization, you can zoom in and out in less than one second. So it's awesome. Layering and separation, it's also very easy because you can distinguish the map from the actual information on top. Small multiples, you remember the comparison and contrast ones. So let's say I'm looking for some kind of restaurants. It's very easy to have them shown into my map, but also on the information layer. There is even the possibility to compare the ratings. So my choice will be much more informed than if I would just try it out. And finally, time and space. So here I picked the car atlas versus, for example, looking for a route on Google Maps. You can not only just give it, uh, type in the, the destination and the starting point, you can choose different transportation possibilities. And actually, the really, really cool thing here is, it's not only about the status quo. 
you can even look up for the route like what would what uh, what time would it take me if i would travel tomorrow during rush hour so you even have this future perspective you can access and this is a super powerful and actually awesome feature we are able to design for right now okay last part the games so this topic I would like to access from two different perspectives. First of all, I would like to have a look on how to utilize interactivity within games. And the second one is how to escape flatland. So what kind of principles can I use in which kind of settings? And uh, for the interactivity part, I decided to uh, use this model by Fagerholt and his team. Um, is there anybody who's not familiar with the digestive theory? Perfect, this will save us time. Um, also, there are lots of examples actually for each category, but I really just cherry picked. So, to give you a broad overview about this one, if, you have, if you're interested and want to have more information, just approach me afterwards. Okay, let's start with the first one with the heads up display. So, you remember it's not part of the game world, not part of the narrative. A great example for micro and macro readings can be found in games like our recent Anno. For example, so you do have a basic interface. I mean, it's a complex interface, but still it's a basic interface. But depending on what kind of activity you would like to do or decisions, uh, you can expand any kind of interface to access more options, more um, features. So it's really um, kind of contextual depending on what you need. Small multiples is really nicely presented in, for example, games like Fallout. Um, here you have the, the perks overview. You see all of them at one glance. You see the levels, you see how much of them uh, are there, which ones are unlocked. And the cool thing is the way they are visualized, you do not need to go to each one of them, click on them and read the information, because you can immediately see just from the type, the visuals are created if it's about stealth, fighting, crafting, and so on. So it gives you a very good idea to see what's out there and how to access it. Examples for narrative of space and time. So I picked one from Assassin's Creed, but basically any skill tree from any game would do because it's about the planning, the timing of your progress, of your skills throughout the time. Another example which I find really intriguing is from Breath of the Wild, the hero's part, because it's a different take on this subject. So you see your whole path that you access throughout the game, you see where you have been, but most likely, which is even more interesting, you see where you have not been. So this will help you to form your decisions about what kind of places you would like to access, maybe find some new points of interest or activities. Okay. This is about huts now moving over to the meta displays. So part of the game, uh, not part of the game world, but part of the narrative. So the very classical one with color information, and you're most likely familiar with it, is um, this kind of damage display you usually get in shooter games to inform you that something is happening, you need to change your actions, you need to adapt to the gameplay and react. Then I have one more, which is a combination of layering and separation and the narratives of space and time. Um, it's from Assassin's Creed Unity, the lock picking feature. And here you do not only have the, like, the reality where you see your assassin uh, lock pick, but you also have this meta representation of the lock on your screen with the different uh, types of blocks. So you can see how many of them you already unlocked. You can tag your progress and plan your actions much better. Okay, we're continuing to the spatial ones, so part of the game world and not part of the narrative. Here I have the layering and separation for you. So um, just some few examples. So it's fine to create a style that is um, consistent with the game world, which really fits to the overall game style. However, for the player, it's very clear that this is not really part of the game world. It's a very great way to layer information on top of the game world and make it more immersive, and nevertheless not merging it with the actual game world. And then we have color and information. So 
obviously this goes hand in hand with the other principle, but here you can see that, again, color is a very strong signifier to point players to points of interest or signify what kind of way, path they need to take to proceed with the level, what kind of choices they can make or even help them to finalize some kind of actions like shooting. So it's a very powerful tool. And this brings us to the last part, the diegetic interfaces or diegetic uh, representation of information within games. And I think with this one, everybody automatically thinks about the Dead Space suit or the Far Cry compass map thingy. And this is obviously a part of it. I will not show those two examples because you know it by heart. But uh, still, this is part of, for example, layering and separation. So it's a same concept we are mostly referring to. And actually, there is a small problem with this one, or it's a huge challenge, because we need to make sure that the information is accessible and really understandable to the player, but still it has to be part of the game world, so our possibilities are really limited. And I believe this is also one of the issues why not so much has happened in the last years in this kind uh, of visualization, because, yeah, as I said, it's challenging and it's also limiting. However, there are different ways to access diegetic information apart from layering and separation. So let's have a look at, for example, micro and macro readings. This is actually my favorite example. Is there anybody who did not play or, not, or are not familiar with Left 4 Dead? Great, awesome. <laughs> so, for example, here, if you reach this micro level where you actually see the witch this near, you're most likely going to die. So what the game did really well was staging the information on a macro level before you even reach the micro level. So before you even see her, you hear her singing. So you hear the sound, you hear the voice. Then you hear the NPCs reacting to this, saying like, it's the crying girl, turn off the lights. So you get lots of clues that will actually help you to um, make your decisions how to successfully survive this kind of enemy before turning it into some kind of frustrating trial and error and dying. So the staging of information on this level is done so well that you are able to actually deal in a correct way with this kind of a very deadly enemy. And finally, uh, examples for narratives of space and time. So um, I picked the Division 2, but actually any other shooter game would do. So what do you think is going to happen in this scene? Hmm? Really? <laughs> okay, any other guesses? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, fight. Why do you know this? Yes. Because again, context is your best friend. So people who play those kind of games are primed to understand and to decode this kind of scenes. Like if I see barrels, cars, boxes, and am I playing a shooter game, I most likely will assume that this is a scene, an environment where I'm going to fight. So I adapt my behavior, change the way I'm maybe approaching this kind of area and will feel more in control because I know what to expect. So. This diegetic approach uh, also helps us to stage information within the environment. And finally, one interesting example from Hellblade. Here, the diegetic information was on a almost purely auditive level, so you had the voices that were obviously a huge part of the narrative, but they were also parts of game design that help you to make your choices, to warn you, uh, signifiers, and so on. So there are much more ways beyond those classical maps and uh, health bars to show information on diegetic displays. So to wrap up my talk, I would like to conclude again with the seeing is thinking quote, because this is like my takeaway I would like to give all of you if you do not remember anything else from the talk. So if you change the way how you show information, people will start to think differently about the subject. So we want to create comparison, contrast, and help the users make their choice. And all of this will create a context for this kind of information. And once we have context, uh, this will reduce any kind of interaction cost on the cognitive side, 
it will enable us to make our decisions faster and they will be better because we feel more informed. And finally, this leads us to player and control. And to sum it up, this leads to player empowerment and satisfaction. And this is what we want to achieve with a satisfying user experience throughout the game. Thank you very much.